ਵਚਨ ਸ਼ਮਾਤ ਕਰ ਦੋ some background that we didn't get to earlier in the week. So this, the, where the scattering equations come from that give rise to the PDF. So scattering theory basics, and then some more advanced scattering theory that leads to the Debye scattering equation and the PDF equation. So this is how we get why the, <coughs> why the PDF 
functions or the way they are is coming. <coughs> All right, so let's just review why, why it's important. Everything is made of atoms. And the key thing is that the property of materials depends not only which atoms the material is made from, but how they're arranged in space. So in order to understand any material, we need to be able to find out where the atoms are. And there's actually a very nice example of this, which is the most simple thing you can imagine. It's carbon. And so carbon has, two, it has multiple forms, but two of its most important forms are diamond and graphite. And if you look at the properties of diamond and graphite, they're exactly opposite of each other. So diamond is a very, very hard. In fact, diamond has industrial applications for its hardness. It's used in cutting wheels. It's used in, as an abrasive for cutting very hard things. It's transparent. It's a wide band gap insulator. It's also extremely expensive. On the other hand, graphite is made of the same materials, pure carbon, but it's very, very soft. In fact, graphite has industrial applications for its softness. It's used in pencil leads. It's used as a lubricant. That's because it's so soft. So diamond is used industrially for its hardness. Graphite is used industrially for its softness, and they're made of the same material. Graphite is not transparent. It's black. It's actually a semi-metal, which means that it conducts electricity in the planes. And it's also extremely cheap. So, of course, what's the difference between diamond and graphite? And it's simply you take the same atoms, you arrange them in space differently, any of the students. Shiva, do you know what it is? That's exactly right. Yeah, so this is actually... Uh, yeah, right, right. <coughs> so this is actually the very first uh, nuclear reactor that was built in the whole world. And it's called Chicago Pile 1. It was built underneath the squash courts in this sports complex of University of Chicago. It was built by Enrico Fermi. And carbon is a very good moderator of neutrons. It slows neutrons down. And carbon is very cheap. So you can make a massively big pile of, of graphite. And so that's what this is. These are big blocks of graphite that they're stacking up into this device here. And these are the people. And that's the, that's the pile there. <coughs> so Chicago pile one. And here they're building it. And then here's actually Enrico Fermi. And here's actually a description from John Cadell. So there are no photographs from this event because it was top secret. It was happening during Second World War. And nobody, nobody on, the, uh, on the American side or the British side wanted anyone to know that it was happening. So there were no photographs. So these paintings were done, I think, by John Cadell later from his memory. And he has this description. So the experiment began at 9.45 a.m. on December the 2nd, 1942. Fermi ordered the zip and all control rods except one removed from the pile. So they had uh, these graphite rods that were down inside and they could pull them up and lower them to put more or less carbon into the system. <clears throat> and carbon was absorbing the neutrons. So that was preventing the thing from undergoing a chain reaction. So at a certain time, Fermi, I don't know what the zip is actually, but it's something like a control rod, I guess. He uh, ordered them all out. <coughs> George Weil, who is actually a physicist, very good physicist, operated the remaining rod by hand. So his job was to lie on top of this nuclear reactor and pull out the the control rod by hand. Fermi ordered removing of the final rod a foot at a time. So basically, they wanted to go very slowly because otherwise George Weil would have been blown up. Yeah. So he moved it up one foot. Then they monitored. 
the neutron flux and then moved it up one foot, monitored everything, monitored everything. Um, with 44 witnesses present at 3 p.m., Fermi asked Weil to withdraw the control rod, the final distance to engage the complete reaction. So Fermi had done these careful calculations and he had figured out <coughs> exactly how far the rod had to be out in order for the thing to reach criticality and to start a chain reaction. And it actually happened exactly that way. So at 3.42 p.m., Fermi concluded that full criticality had been achieved and ordered to zip in. The world's first self-sustained nuclear reaction had been achieved. And it was all done on a big pile of graphite. Now, I, I always thought that it was called Chicago Pile because it was a big pile of graphite. And I think most people actually assume that that's the case. But it turns out that actually Fermi was Italian. He was working in Italy. He was a theorist at University of Rome. And <coughs> Mussolini came in. Mussolini was a basically fascist dictator. And he started trying to mimic uh, Hitler and he started anti-Semitism, so he started wanting to persecute Jewish people. And Fermi was not Jewish, but his wife was Jewish. And so in 19, <clears throat> 1937 or 38, so I think one year, 1937, he left uh, Italy and he came to Columbia University in New York, that's my university, and he gave some lectures and then he went back. And then in 1938, he came again to Columbia University, and he didn't go back. So he basically defected to the U.S. and stayed there, and then he was behind building this first nuclear reactor in the U.S. So that's what happened there. <clears throat> and then the next thing that happened, because Fermi was Italian, is he opened a bottle of Chianti. And they all <coughs> drank wine to celebrate this event. And then all the people who were there, they signed the bottle. So this is a very historic, empty bottle of Chianti wine. All right. <coughs> so this is just motivating that we need to study structure. We need to find out how that happened in the collision region. So <coughs> that's exactly what we do when we, when we do scattering experiment. We have, a, we have an incident beam we know about. It's highly characterized. We have a scattered beam that we detect, and that's highly characterized. So we know a lot about the incoming beam, and we know a lot about the scatter. And then what we try and do is we infer some... Okay, I put this in the wrong place. So what we're going to do is we're going to discuss a little bit about... Um, collisions physicists so physicists are very used to having a hypothesis then doing a, an experiment to test it so they said why don't we apply physics principles to teaching and learning so what you do is you say I have a hypothesis that this way of teaching is more effective for the person to learn but nobody ever tests that so they said okay we're going to do these tests virtually no conceptual understanding so the lecturing is actually very ineffective for you to gain conceptual understanding. It's an okay way to transmit factual information, but conceptual understanding, not. And so actually the person leading this was Eric Matter, who's at Harvard University. And so you think Harvard University is one of the top Ivy League universities in the US. So the, it's like IIT, the top, top students go to Harvard. So they should be able to learn. And Eric Matter was actually one of the top, top teachers. He got very good assessments, student assessments. The students thought he was a wonderful teacher. He gave good lectures. And so he did this test and he said, I'm Eric Matter, I'm at Harvard. I have Harvard students, I'm the great teacher. This is not good, I'm not gonna get the same result. And he got the same result. And then I tried it in my class. I was at Michigan State at the time, and I was teaching mechanics, and I had 250 students. So I had quite good statistics. And I did this, and <clears throat> I gave the test at the beginning of the course. 
and I got almost perfect binomial distribution. That's the distribution you expect to get if the people are guessing randomly. So it's a multiple choice test. If people guess randomly and you plot the distribution, it'll be a beautiful binomial distribution, and it was, except that there was a tiny tail. So some small, much less than 10% of the people basically actually knew it already. And I hadn't even taught anything. So then I'm teaching the course and I'm using my standard lecturing. And then at the end of the course, I <coughs> and <coughs> so you read or listen to the question. And then I give you proposed answers. So there's multiple choice answers, four or five multiple choice answers. Now you think about it by yourself and you decide which one best answer one answer is best, and you remember its letter, so it'll be A, B, C, D, E, something like that. You remember its letter. See how many people are voting for each answer. But you must keep your eyes closed the whole time, no cheating. <laughs> Otherwise, Professor Kana will do some terrible thing to you. <laughs> I will keep my eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> so be, be warned, everyone, that he has his eyes open, even as you have your eyes closed. Okay, now everyone has to vote. Everyone has to vote, and everyone has to vote once. And if you're not sure, just guess. doesn't matter, because there's no grade attached to this. This is a mechanism for you to gain greater conceptual understanding. It's not to test your understanding. And actually, the best learning happens when you get things wrong and then figure out why you got them wrong. So it's actually best if you get it wrong, honestly. So just don't worry about it. Don't be stressed. <clears throat> OK, and then what, we, what, what typically happens then is I'll get a distribution of your, of your votes by the letter. And then um, if there's a broad distribution, which there often is, then something that we often do is I'll make you turn to your neighbor and you discuss with your neighbor. So you turn to your neighbor, and the first thing you say is, hello, what's your name? And things like that. Um, you don't have to ask that. Um, but, you know, be, be kind and polite. And then you say, I voted for D, subtleties in conceptual issues. And then what we do is we vote again. And sometimes there's a big change in the distribution. It depends how persuasively you argued your case. So if you were argued D and you had a very strong reason, you might persuade the person who answered E that D is the correct answer. Or you might not persuade them. They might stick with their original answer. OK. All right, so we're going to do one. So this is the question. <coughs> a mouse is A, big. B, small, C, both, D, either, E, neither. All right, so think about it for a little bit, what your best answer is. You ready? Ready to vote? Does anyone have any questions about this voting? <laughs> You're ready. OK, so <clears throat> everyone close your eyes, except Professor Kana. <laughs> eyes closed. OK, let me get by the board here. All right. Okay, who thinks A, big? Who thinks B, small? Who thinks C, both? Who thinks D, either? Who 
try and connect with your eye. And this is what I draw up this way. Beautiful bra. Okay. So we will try this thing. So you can is everyone paired up with someone? If you're not, maybe just scooch over so that you can talk to someone. But do you want to go over there? <coughs> okay, so just turn to your neighbor and then try and ask them what they voted for and then ask them why. Even, <coughs> even, even if you voted for the same thing, <coughs> ask why you voted for that because you may have different reasons. Okay, so let's stop this now and then um, we're going to re-vote. <clears throat> so the voting goes the same way, but <clears throat> if you've changed your mind, then vote for the new answer, or if you haven't changed your mind, vote for the same answer, okay? So everyone, except Professor Kana, close your eyes. <laughs> All right, who thinks A? And then B? And then C? And then D? And then E? Okay, and so now it looks like this. You can open your eyes. <laughs> so it's a big delta function. So this is good. You guys are very uh, pliable. You can persuade each other. So, um, let me ask somebody who voted for D why you voted for D. So who voted for D? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so why did you vote for D? Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> so I think the mouse can be small or big. The mouse can be small or big. But why can the mouse not be small and big? What, 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 what? what? What determines what determines whether the mouse or three or so it actually depends a little bit on the observer. So is the is the size of an object an attribute of the object, or is it an attribute of the observer? But um, let's say, let's come back to your or, and I don't have, oh, I have someone who voted C, Rose, who's my C person? Okay, so this is a courtroom, and this person has posited that uh, the mouse, yeah, he has to stand up. <laughs> because you are getting to fight now. <laughs> so she says that the mouse is 
big and small, so big or small. But, yeah, and you say it, it's big and small. What's your? It depends on the reference frame. It does depend on the reference frame. But the, the, the key thing here is whether it's big and small, both, or whether it's big or small. Why leaves on trees are green, I need to somehow model the entire universe and understand the whole universe. Uh, and then, you know, at the end of all this calculation, I'll determine that the leaves are green and then I'll, I'll trace back and I'll figure out why they're green. But this is very impractical and not only that, it's impossible. And the universe is very big. There's a hundred billion galaxies and there's a hundred thousand in made of small things with a well-defined boundary. So an example, is, um, an example is this room. So this room is a big thing. And the small things that this room is made of is the people in it, the chairs, the desks. And the boundary of the room is basically the walls and the door. And once I make some system like that, then I can start actually doing analysis on that system. I can look at how the small things interact with each other. I can, I can, I can try and compute conservation laws, like is energy conserved in that system? Is momentum conserved in that system? I can apply these basic rules, and then I can understand a lot about the world. So in that case, the room is big the people are small, because the system is a big thing made of small things. So the room is big, the people are small. But your person and you are also made up of even smaller parts, right? So if I wanted to model you as a person, I would say the person is the big thing, and the small thing, the th 
things the person is made of is, is eyes and ears and nose, legs, arms. And I can go down even further. I can say, what's your eye? Uh, your eye was a small thing in you, the big thing, but let's make the eye the big thing. What's the eye made of? And it's made of a cornea, retina, uh, whatever. I don't even know what an eye is made of. Okay, so basically this concept of whether things are big or small is really fundamental to how we model the universe. And actually when I'm, this is really the true answer that everything is both big and small. But when I'm operating as a scientist, I want to do a very careful job of picking my system and then analyzing it. Okay? Does it make sense? All right, so we're going to do this for collisions. Here's a question. In all collisions, energy and momentum are both conserved. A, no, momentum and energy are never conserved. Yes, both momentum and energy are always conserved. C, momentum is always conserved, but energy is not always conserved. D, energy is always conserved, but momentum is not always conserved. Okay, I think that's all. So think about that for a bit. yet with your own opinion. All right, you ready? Dr. Kanna? <laughs> but that doesn't mean everyone else shouldn't. Okay. So, okay, so close your eyes. Everyone votes exactly once. Yes, both momentum and energy are always conserved. See, momentum is always conserved, but energy is not always conserved. And D, energy is always conserved, momentum is not always conserved. Okay, you can open your eyes, and this is our distribution here. So this shows you how difficult physics is. Because Um, again, this is a basic conceptual thing from introductory physics, right, about collisions. But you have a very broad distribution of views. Okay, so let's do this thing. Why don't you convince your neighbor that your vote is the correct vote? Demerit. 
C D Okay, so this time it looks like we well I haven't probably counted quite correctly. But more or less just one person changed their mind. So you guys are now all very confident in your answers. Okay, so who wants to start? Somebody who picked something. Should we start with, which one should we start with? B. Let's start with B. Okay, who, who voted for B? You have to put your hand up if you voted for B. Everyone's in the universe. Kind of. Is that the, is that the yes. Does anyone else from B have anything to add to that? Why do you think they're both conserved? What about um, C? So some of you voted for C, that momentum is conserved, energy is not conserved. What's your reasoning for that? Who voted for C? Elastic collision or an elastic wow, collision. Every type answer. of collision. Yes. Elastic and inelastic collisions. In every type of collision, uh, momentum is always remains conserved. But if we talk about an elastic kind of collision or perfectly inelastic, some part of energy of that system will convert into another form of energy. Uh, that's why. Yeah. So, how do you, how do, yeah, but, how do the B people respond to that? So but overall, overall energy is always conserved. Mm -hmm. Overall, Overall, if we talk about the universe as a whole system, then we can take it. But for that particular system, energy is not conserved. Energy is going into another form. But that energy is going somewhere. Somewhere it is not anything. It depends. It depends on. We are talking about the whole system or whole universe. Ah, okay. So it depends what you're talking about. It depends what your system is. Yes. Ah. So can you elaborate more on that? Yeah. 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 Y
But what it's actually talking about is it's actually talking about the mechanical energy, not the total energy. So in this case, a lot of energy has gone into deforming metal. Right? So in the universe as a whole, the energy is conserved. But you get a complete, actually, probably all of these answers, well, because this says momentum and energy are never conserved, I'm not sure. But basically, depending how you define your system, you can more or less get any situation you want. So if I, if I say my system is this guy, right? This is a perfectly legitimate system. This is a um, this is a big thing made of small things, and I've just defined the boundary. This is a good system. <coughs> when this thing hits that thing, its momentum was high and it goes to zero. So it, the momentum, my system momentum, is not conserved. Um, the uh, my system energy is, I think it's not conserved as well, right? On the other hand, if I make my system to be this, then actually momentum is conserved. So the total momentum of the system is conserved. What about <coughs> What about if this was happening? If this was happening, but they were on a hill. What's the situation now? So, obviously, if I make this to be the system, momentum is not conserved. But if I make this to be the system, is momentum conserved in that collision? said no. Someone said no, or some thinks yes. I'll do the external force. This is the right. So, so where does the law of where does the law of conservation of momentum come from, actually? It comes from Newton's third law. Newton's third law says that for any action, there's an equal and opposite. Reaction. So any force, there's an equal force in the other direction, right? And what that means is that if I, if I, but, but things happen, right? So this thing will experience a force if I draw a system around this thing. Actually, what's happening there is that there's, a, there's an external force being applied to that thing, right? If I, if I put this on a hill. What's actually happening is I've actually allowed an external force to act. It's gravity. And gravity is coming from the interaction of these bodies with the Earth. So how can I, how can I restore momentum conservation then? By what? Yeah, so actually then if I put these guys on the Earth, and I make my system to include the Earth and the particles, then I will have momentum conserved again. So I'm just kind of showing you this, that actually, um, when we teach you stuff in physics, we're usually lying to you. But if you can understand this concept, and if you can apply this concept, you get a lot of insight. There's another problem that you guys often probably work on, which looks like this. You have, a, you have a sloping plane, and then there's a pulley here, and then there's a block, and there's a rope, and then there's another weight here. We've all studied these problems, right, and tried to solve them. It turns out, actually, that, that this is a collision. It doesn't look like a collision, but it is a collision. We've got actually two objects that are interacting with each other through force, and the system evolves over time. And so you can treat this problem just like a collision, and you can do the same games of drawing different systems. So I can say, I'm going to draw a system around this guy, and I'm going to analyze what's happening to this guy. I'm going 
going to draw a system around this guy. I'm going to analyze what's happening to this guy. And I'm going to draw a system around the whole thing. And I'm going to analyze that. And that's basically how you solve the problem. And that's how you were taught to solve the problem, except nobody explained to you, probably, how, how you were using systems. And the system concept is so powerful, you can apply it in, in, in really a lot of your work, the stuff that you're doing in the lab as well. All right. Oh, there was another one. So, so the right answer is, it depends, really. Oh, so the right answer was E. But <laughs> <coughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends, but it, it, it depends again on you, the observer. You're the observer, so you're in control. You can do whatever you want. So the power of systems analysis is that you're in charge. You can choose a system. There's no wrong system and there's no right system. There are definitely better systems and worse systems. You want to pick a system that's going to produce a simple, a simple quick solution. Um, but you can pick any system and you can try it and see whether it works. Okay. So when we're talking about um, scattering and collisions, we need to keep track of the energy. And <clears throat> oh, let me ask a, another question. So if we if we think about the if we think about the inelastic collision, which was these two um, rickshaws hitting each other, and what we know is that in the whole scheme of the universe, energy was conserved, but the mechanical energy of that system was not conserved, right? So why did, why did, if both of those statements are true, why don't we, why don't we keep track of all the energy and apply energy conservation in that case? Why do, we just, why do we just say, oh, I'm going to throw away this powerful concept of energy conservation when I'm trying to solve this problem? Energy is conserved, but energy is not conserved. But we know that that's not true. Momentum and energy are always conserved. So why do we talk about something that where there's not conservation like that? I mean, I'm very interested in sound energy. I like music, for example, but it's too difficult to compute, right? If you wanted to actually keep track of where all the energy went in a rickshaw collision, you, can't, you simply can't actually compute it. It's too difficult to figure out where it went. You've got deformation of the metal, which is atoms moving over each other. You, the, uh, uh, the, the metal is heating up. That heat is moving around, it's dissipating, there's sound that comes off. I mean, it's, and there's no way that we can like, keep track of it. Or, so we just say, forget it, I'm going to throw away my energy conservation law. But when we're thinking about collisions of, of quantum particles, like very small collisions of quantum particles, it's actually very easy to keep track of where all the energy went, because there's not, many, there's not many channels, there's not many different places where the energy goes. So I only have to keep track of one or two or three different places where the energy is gone. So I've got, a, I've got a quantum particle, which is like a photon, an X-ray photon. And it, under, and it hits another particle, like an electron. And it bounces off the electron all I have to do is I have to measure the energy of the incoming photon, I have to measure the energy of the outgoing photon, and I have to measure the energy of the electron that it bounced off. There's only like three things. I can actually keep track of it. So what we do in our, in our quantum collisions is we keep track of the energy conservation and the momentum conservation. So if you have a photon, the... Um, the energy is given by h nu, which is h bar omega. <coughs> and um, this is the frequency of the wave. 
if you have um, a particle wave, then the momentum, the magnitude of the momentum, which is a scalar, is given by this, which is the magnitude of the, of the momentum vector, is equal to h over lambda. And if we take h over 2 pi and 2 pi over lambda, then we get something that looks like, like a, and we define k as being the wave vector, <coughs> which is 2 pi times lambda. Then we get h bar k. So the, so the magnitude of the momentum is given by the magnitude of the wave vector, which is 2 pi over lambda times the Planck constant. And so the momentum vector is given by the Planck constant times the wave vector. Okay, so we have these two things. This is the wave vector. And what's the wave vector? It has this magnitude, 2 pi over lambda, and it points in the direction of propagation of the wave. So that's the wave vector. And it tells you the momentum that that wave is carrying through the de Broglie relation. And the energy that that wave is carrying is given by this h bar omega. So we can then define the scattering vector Q. So we have an incoming, incoming particle wave, which is K initial. It bounces off something in the target. It goes off and it has an outgoing particle wave, Kf. And the quantity that we're generally interested in is we want to know, we want to keep track of what the momentum change was of our particle. So why do we care about the momentum change of our particle? What, what are we trying to learn about? When we do a scattering experiment, are we trying to learn about the x-ray? What are we trying to learn about? You're trying to learn about the system that you're scattering off. And how do we learn about the system that we're scattering off? We measure some property of this particle that's doing the scattering, and we infer something about the system. So <clears throat> if we measure the change in momentum of the particle that's scattered, what do we learn about the system? Exactly the same energy and momentum that was transferred to it. So we can actually, by doing this, we can find the spectrum of energy levels and we can find their momentum inside the system. So it's actually a very, very plane wave coming in. So we have a, a plane wave that comes in, and it's, let's say it's an electromagnetic wave, an X-ray. Charged particle, and when a charged particle accelerates, so it's oscillating up, it's accelerating, and then it's accelerating down, accelerating up. When that thing um, oscillates like that, it, it mediates. there's a spherical wave that propagates out from the electron that was excited. Now, when we do our experiments, that's all happening in a tiny little sample that's sitting in a powder which is sitting on the diffractometer. And we have a plane wave coming in. It excites those electrons, and they come out as a spherical. Uh, they come out as a wave like this. But compared to the size of the atom and the size of the electron, our detector is extremely far away. So our detector is one meter away. And the size of the atom is one angstrom, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So the, the distance between this spherical wave event here and our detector is 10 orders of magnitude. So it would be like something happening here in Amritsar and we're detecting it on the moon or something like that. So <coughs> we have to dot, dot, dot out far. And now actually this spherical wave has got a very large curved wave front like this. But that's only kind of to the edge of the sample yet. By the time we get to the detector, this, it's spherical, but the circle is, has such a large diameter that it's actually now a plane wave. So the way that we model the, the scattering in the far field is that we have an incoming plane wave. That's our, in, that's our incident, incident photon. And we finally detect an outgoing plane wave. And so the, <coughs> the plane wave has the, this general form. Has, there's actually a minus omega t in there, but I don't want to go through all that messy stuff. So <coughs> there's basically 
So this is the amplitude of this wave in the far field. And it has a prefactor, which I'll come back to, but it has this form, this exponential form. So this is just a sum of sines and cosines. So I could actually write cosine here, or I could write sine, but actually it's more mathematically convenient to write it as an exponential. And the, um, it turns out that the, this thing here is telling you the phase of the wave, and it's this change in momentum dotted onto R, where R is the, uh, is, is the distance. Well, initially it's just the distance from this, from this, we, we're just doing scattering from a single particle right now. So this R is the distance from the particle. So what we, what we would measure if we measured the amplitude of this wave is we'd see this thing that was oscillated in time, depends on the, the, the probability of this event happening. And so that's actually the scattering power of this object. So th this thing is actually proportional to the, once you've, once you've normalized out the incident intensity, this thing here is proportional to the scattering power of that object. So in classical theory, it's, it's the probability of, of the scat in scat In classical theory, it's something like the amplitude of the scattering amplitude. But in quantum mechanics, it's the transition probability. It's the probability that you will move uh, uh, an object from its initial quantum state to some final quantum state. But just get used to this. We're going to see these things all, all, all the time. Um, so this thing here is an amplitude, wave amplitude. And basically, the total, the total amplitude that we measure here, what, what we're going to have is we have an atom now, and it has many electrons in it. So we're actually going to see over here, we're going to see the intensity from scattering from all of the electrons inside that atom. So all I have to do is I have to sum up here over here. And in general, what's happening is that the wave is coming in continuously, the scattering is happening continuously. So we actually don't do a sum over these scattering events. We do an integral over the scattering events multiplied by the electron density. So the probability of scattering is going to be higher at some location in space if the electron density is higher in that location in space. So when you do that integral, you get this atomic form factor. The, uh, we're summing over all of these events, and then we're going to integrate over them. Um, I'm going to keep going a little bit longer. I'm supposed to go to 11, or? or you can have to break off. Yeah, let me do just a little bit more, because, yes. yeah. So we've, we've, we've learned how to scatter off a single electron, and we've learned how to scatter off an electron cloud. <coughs> what we do now is we take our atoms and we arrange to have to have a detector, and the detector response would have to be quicker than the wave, than the speed of the wave, so that I could measure the beginning of the wave, the middle of the wave, the edge, and the edge of the wave, then I could get the amplitude. But if my detector is too slow to measure that, all that happens is the wave hits my detector, and it gets absorbed. I absorb the energy. I'm using conservation of energy again. I absorb the energy of the particle. And if I count the number of particles that come in, I get the intensity. And intensity is proportional to the modulus squared of the amplitude. Um, when we take the mod squared, we keep the, we keep the square of the amplitude, but we lose the phase information, which is up in, up, up in this exponential here. So that's the phase problem. OK. So let me stop. But I want to do one thing. Should I do one thing? I'll show how to... Let's have tea. Yeah. Is tea ready or not? It's ready. Ah.